is Tal, and today we're going to be discussing the Mandate of Palestine. And we're going to be doing it through uh, looking at different documents from that time period. Now, the majority of documents that we view from that time period are historical speeches or different certificates or the conclusions of different uh, treaties that were had. Um, but we don't get to see the everyday documents, uh, people's birth certificates, uh, maps that weren't um, presented to everyone. Uh, we don't get to see the daily lives of people who had to fill out tax forms or have personal identification pa passes in order to get from one place to another. And for the past six, seven months, that's what I've been doing. I've been collecting those documents. Uh, I've been doing it through a wide variety of means, through auctions, eBay, uh, people who reach out to me and want to sell me something or actually donate to me. I've also had people who are very kind to donate uh, to my collection. Uh, I also go to markets, to random shops, and I sit there for hours trying to find these documents because most people, you know, when they see a dirty old piece of paper, they tend to just throw it away and they don't really look at maybe what they have. And some of these are very personal documents. I mean, I have birth certificates that tell the lives of people who lived over 100 years ago. And sometimes it's surprising that these documents don't stay in the family. Uh, people ask me, have you tried reaching out to these families? Um, and sadly, the majority of people who are giving away these documents, it's either because they found them in a, in a pile of documents when their grandfather or great-grandfather died, or simply they don't see any significance to them, so they give them away. And I get the honor of being able to hold on to those documents and have them in my own collection. And I thought I wanted to not only present them as I have on my personal Twitter account, where I upload every single uh, document that I get, but also give some historical context beyond the character limit that Twitter allows. And so that's what this live stream is for. We're going to be looking at a number of documents from that period and discuss the bigger picture going on at that time. Now, there are a lot of things going on between 1918 and 1948. Uh, this is the period of the documents that I currently have. Uh, that I'm going to be showcasing today. My earliest document in my collection is currently 1885, 84, and the oldest document is in the 80s, 1980s. Now, a lot of things were happening back then. Different conferences, the White Papers, uh, Declaration of Independence, Nakba, um, correspondence, and all these things, They we don't sometimes understand what they mean and, and what their connection to, to different events are. And so I hope that by looking at specific documents, we can understand a piece of the bigger story of the British Mandate of Palestine. The first document that we're going to be looking at is Teudat Aliyah. Teudat Aliyah is a Palestine immigration certificate that was specifically given to Jews. Now, why specifically to Jews and not Arabs who immigrated? Well, this was a part of the Jewish Agency of, for Palestine. Now, the Jewish Agency for Palestine uh, had a a number of different names before it became the Jewish Agency for Palestine and then eventually the Jewish Agency for Israel. Um, and its main goal was to facilitate immigration, uh, help Jews who were currently living in the land, buy land. And when there was the San Remo conference, which was in 1920, and the whole point of that conference was that once the British took control of the land, they had to discuss what they were going to do with it, um, how they were going to allocate the land, uh, who was going to be in control of what in regard to the mandate. And the San Romero Conference essentially built the framework for what the land was going to be. Um, a part of the San Romero Conference, specifically Article 4, gives the Jewish agency um, the authority to dictate uh, how Jews are going to be immigrating to the country and to the land, to the mandate, at that time period in terms of letting them uh, handle themselves. Now, the whole reason that the Jewish agency was involved at all is because in 1917, there was the Balfour Declaration. Now, we're going to discuss the Balfour Declaration a little bit later in another document. But just to summarize it slowly here, the Balfour Declaration essentially was a promise by the, Jewish, by the British government to the Jews, saying that they promised that they would establish a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. Now, we'll discuss what that means. Does it mean a national homeland? Does it mean a country? Does it mean simply a community? And what are the boundaries of that national homeland? And we'll discuss that later. Um, but 
in order to help facilitate this Jewish national homeland to come about, as was prescribed in the Balfour Declaration and later in the San Remo Conference, they facilitated the Jewish Agency for Palestine in order to have that come about. Now, this specific document that is in my collection is from the time of the fourth Aliyah. Now, there were a number, there were five Aliyot to Israel. Aliyah means to immigrate, to make Aliyah, to come back to the land. Uh, the first one was in 1882, and it ended in 1937, if I remember correctly. This specifically, the fourth Aliyah, was one of the biggest ones uh, due to the fact that America had issued a new uh, origin-based quota, which means they wouldn't take, uh, a, after a certain amount of people coming from one country, they wouldn't uh, take them in anymore. And so a lot of Jews ended up coming, I see I wrote you with two uh, E's, that's incorrect, um, a lot of Jews ended up immigrating to Palestine at the time, uh, over 80,000, and also a lot of economic factors. At that time, uh, Palestine was starting to grow very well economically, a lot due to the, the Jewish community that was growing in the land. A lot of Arabs were immigrating as well and coming for work from Egypt. Uh, the British mandate was also, remember, this area was in total decay after the World War I, when the Ottoman Empire uh, lost its territory to the Allied forces and specifically Britain in this area. And so this individual was a part of that. Now, I don't have much information on him because I don't like to say what his name was if I'm not 100% certain. Um, from what I do know, he made Aliyah from, if I remember, Tashuak, can't remember the name, uh, Chotovic, I think it was called, which is actually interesting because at the time it was in Poland. It's on the northern eastern side of Poland at the time, but today it's actually in Ukraine uh, because the borders boundaries shifted uh, after World War II. Uh, he was actually quite smart, the individual. He knew multiple languages, four, including Hebrew. Uh, his specific uh, talent uh, in terms of what his actual, uh, you know, capabilities was is he was a farmer. So that's what he came as. He came as a farmer to the land. And what we can see from looking through this document is essentially the Jewish agency would, you would have to pay a certain amount of money to them, not much, but you'd have to pay for different facilities. And then they would help you establish yourself within the land. And these are the different things that he owed them, as can be seen here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in the, in the Hova, in the uh, left side of the paper, there were three, there were three places within uh, the Mandate of Palestine where Jews, when they immigrated, could go to in order to get these documents and be certified as being within the land. That was in Yafo, in Haifa, and in Jerusalem. Uh, interestingly enough, and we're going to see this more and more time, is any document that is in Hebrew is always going to have Eretz Israel, not, not Palestine, not Palestine, or not uh, Palestina. Um, because Jews have always referred to the land in terms of the region as Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. Uh, which refers back to the ancient kingdoms of the Jewish people over almost 3,000 years ago. And so that's this document. Um, the next thing that we're going to be looking at is stamps. Now, stamps can actually tell us a really interesting story regarding the time period and what was happening back then. The first stamps that we're seeing on the left, the EEEF stamp, postage paid, was actually only produced between 1918 and 1920. Now, they are produced by the Egyptian Exp Expeditionary Force. Now, the Egyptian Expeditionary Force were not Egyptians. They were, they were British soldiers who were sent to Egypt in order to secure the national interests of Britain within Egypt, and specifically the Suez Canal. Now, these soldiers were also used to harper um, the, the, advantage, the advances of the Ottoman Empire during World War I. And so they invaded... Uh, the Ottoman Empire, specifically the Valiet of Al-Quds, uh, Sanjak of Al-Quds, of Nablus, and uh, Akka in around 1917-1918. And when they took it over, they didn't know what to do regarding stamps, so they created this stamp. Uh, specifically, if you notice, it's only in English and in uh, Arabic because at this time, Hebrew was not an official language of the land. Later on, in 1920, during uh, the time when mandatory Palestine was starting to be established uh, in San Romero, the agreement for the establishment of um, a mandatory a mandate of Palestine uh, was established, but it only became official in 1922. 
Now, something very interesting at first we're seeing is the, if you look at the orange stamp, you'll see that it's the exact same stamp as the previous stamp, except now it includes Palestine in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. And later on, in every single iteration, we have the, by law, they had to have everything be in all three languages, English, Hebrew, and Arabic. Now, the reason we're seeing in Hebrew, uh, Palestina, and then Eretz Yisrael, the Aleph and the Yud, is because at the time, there was a lot of debate over uh, what they were going to be calling it in Hebrew. Originally, they simply wanted the direct translation from Palestine to Hebrew to be Palestina. But the Jews objected to this, saying that this isn't how we call the land, and we don't want it to be a simple translation. We want it to be Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. And the Arabs refused to have this. They wanted it to be Palestine as well. And so there was a compromise. The compromise was that it would be written in Hebrew, Palestina, but you would have the abbreviation of Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. And that's why also in coins, you're always going to see Palestine in Hebrew. And then in the little Sogoim inside the iterations, you're going to see the Aleph and the Yud, which means Eretz Yisrael. And that is in every single official document during that time had to have this. Um, these are other different examples. In 1923, I think it was, there was a competition for new stamps to come out. And there were a number of different designs. Uh, we can see here on the 50 and the middle row on the, on the left side is actually Tiberius. The one on the right next to it is the Tomb of the Patriarchs, um, Abraham, the Mosque of Abraham. And not on this one, the next slide, if we look here, we also see that they have the uh, Temple Mound, specifically the Dome of the Rock. And these were the three strands that were produced at that time in, in terms of the imagery of this area. And there's uh, also a lot of uh, discussion about the rarity of stamps in regards to communities of collectors. Me personally, it, it's less uh, important to me that something is rare or common. I just like having it in the collection because I think it tells a story. But these specifically, for example, are unminted, unminted uh, stamps. So what's interesting is that these were never, some of them were never actually used in circulation. Specifically, some of them, they're actually still together. Um, the next, we're going to be talking about um, Palestinian nationalism. So the next thing that we're going to be talking about is Palestinian nationalism. And we're doing this in the context of the Mandate of Palestine and discussing a lot of the issues that arose due to it, uh, because we're going to be looking at birth certificates and see actually what the nationality of these people are. Now, there are two issues with defining Palestinian nationalism. One is political and one is geographical. First, in regard to the political, there are three different issues. So at the time of the mandate, um, I see there are a few uh, grammar mistakes. Forget that. Pretend you didn't see it. Um, at the time of the mandate from 1925, anyone who was in the land, uh, was born in the land or immigrated and asked for citizenship became a Palestinian. Jews, Arab, Christians, everyone who was in Palestine could, just like any other place in the world, get citizenship, and they were all considered Palestinian. In 1968, the National Palestinian Charter, um, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, they released um, a charter where they defined, in their eyes, what a Palestinian is, and this has kept until today. Now, according to Article 4 and 5 and 6, first, Arabs until 1947 that resided in Palestine and descendants of fathers. So there are two things here. One, it means that any Arab that, according to the Palestinian National Charter, any Arab who immigrated to the land, um, the mandate of Palestine, even if they immigrated in 1946 and a year later they were still there, then they would be considered Palestinian. Um, and also, for example, if a mother is Palestinian, in terms of citizenship, but she only, but the father isn't, then the child is not considered Palestinian uh, by the National Palestinian Charter. The second thing is in regard to Jews. Now, Jews are considered Palestinian only if they were there before 19, uh, for 1882. Why 1882? As previously stated, 1882 is when the first Aliyah, which they termed the Zionist invasion began. So any Jew or their descendants before 1882 would be considered Palestinian, according to the National Palestinian Charter. But after 1882, any Jew who resided in the land in terms of immigrated would not be considered Palestinian. 
in the Hamas covenant of 1988, Palestine has a very different understanding because they look at it through Islamic law. They look at it much more of a religious battle, um, not of a national one like the uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization does, which is a uh, secular organization. And so there is no clear definition to what it means to be a Palestinian, but the entire area of the land is considered Islamic um, land. And so it would all be under a interpretation of Sharia law, law. Now, the second is geographical. And there are two issues here. First is the region of Palestine, uh, which the, the reason I didn't, I put a question mark is because there's a lot of uh, speculation about when it actually begun, when they began to be calling it uh, Palestine, if it was from the Greeks or the Romans or afterwards. But the land changed constantly. Were they referring to a people specifically? Were they were uh, referring to the northern portion of the land or the southern or the entire land in a whole? And the, also the mandate of Palestine. It's important to understand that the what Palestine was what was considered Palestine in terms of a region in map in uh, very old maps is not the same region that was the mandate of Palestine. And even in the mandate of Palestine, there were shifts in terms of what was considered the, the mandate of Palestine which we'll discuss um, later. Uh, specifically, this is an example. This is a map that I have. This is from 1885, and it's from the Britannica Encyclopedia. And if we look on the map, you'll see there are a number of different uh, names. You have on the bottom Judea, then Samaria, and then the Galil. These are three ancient biblical names that were given to the region, and they have connections to uh, or, or Jewish origins. Um, Judea and Samaria were each cities, and they were also kingdoms, Jewish kingdoms within the region. And the Galil has significance also with Christians in terms of where Jesus was in Nablus. Um, and that's also a very significant region. But we see the entire area is called Palestine. Now, if you compare this map with modern day uh, Israel, and you exclude, for example, the Golan Heights, which isn't, con which isn't in this map, um, also, the Tiberias, the the uh, Kinneret, the Lake uh, Kinneret, is not included in the ancient understanding of the Palestine in some maps. In this iteration, it is, but it's not very clear where it ends. How deep into what is now Jordan does this region actually conclude? As well, not um, the land actually ends at Beersheba, which is a southern town in modern-day Israel. If you look at the map of um, Israel here, you'll see southern uh, Israel, and after that. Palestine ends in this map. And so all the way down to a lot is not considered Palestine anymore in this map. But that changes a lot because, for example, at this period, which we'll talk about later, there were different um, provinces and districts of the Ottoman Empire that did encompass that entire area. And they were called the region of Palestine. Now, the birth certificates themselves, they're in various conditions. Uh, not everyone kept them uh, well, but thankfully I was able to get three. Um, Interestingly enough, there are two uh, birth certificates in my collection that have the exact same nationality. So in this one, we see that the nationality of the father is Palestinian, but the mother is stateless, which means that the mother came from abroad and she never talked about where she was from. And for some reason, she isn't listed with a nationality on the actual birth certificate. But the father is considered Palestinian and he is Jewish. In the second document, it's different. The mother is Turkish and the father is Greek. And in the third document, we see the exact same thing again. The father is Palestinian and the mother is, has, is stateless, has no religion. All three of these documents belong to Jewish couples from the um, time of the mandate. The next thing we're going to be looking at is a leave and duty card. This leave and duty card belonged to a Jewish soldier who fought for the British in 1944. Now, why were Jews fighting for the British in 1944? Well, in 1939, only two days after Germany declared war on Poland, uh, Britain went to war with Germany and declared war on it. Uh, there was mixed emotions about within the Jewish community at this time of whether to fight with the British or against the British. The general consensus among different British um, Jewish groups within the mandate was to fight with the British. The only group that objected to this was the Lehi which we'll talk about later, which was a Jewish paramilitary organization, which operated in the mandate from the 1940s. Um, and so 
from the 19, early 1940s, when the war began, the British started getting volunteer troops, Arab and Jewish troops, uh, as equal as possible amongst troops to fight for the British um, overseas. Uh, but there was constantly a request by Ben-Gurion and the rest of the, the Zionist uh, leadership to allow for a separate Jewish brigade to establish itself. Uh, this was constantly uh, thrown away and they didn't want to allow it. But finally, in August of 1944, um, not long until the end of the war, they finally formed the Jewish Brigade. And so this most likely belonged because the Jewish Brigade was only formed in August of 1944. And we see that this individual, uh, the earliest stamp that we know about this individual is from 1944 at the MHS Moretta. The MHS Moretta was a Navy base in Haifa that belonged to the British, uh, the British Army. Now, we do have more information about him, but first look at the top of this chart, which is native leave. And the reason it says that is because this individual, Joseph Goldstein, wasn't uh, an immigrant. He lived here himself, or he was an immigrant, but most likely not considering his age. Uh, he never date left UK, which means that he wasn't coming from overseas. As you can see, this document was meant for British soldiers, non-Jewish British soldiers from overseas. That's why we have date left UK. Um, we have Christian name uh, and other de de designations. Um, but we see that this individual was named Joseph Goldstein. His mother was named mother's name was Eve, and they lived in Haifa, which is in the north of Israel. Uh, really interestingly, you'll see in a few different documents uh, how they define uh, what you were was changed, varied on document. For example, on this document, under religion, you have Jew. But for example, if you look at these uh, birth certificates, it's under community. If we'll go back and actually look at that. If you look under, uh, where is it? So here it's religion, but there are other documents I think I, I showcase later on that actually show community, and then another one actually shows race being Jewish. And so that has to do with how being Jewish was perceived back then. Uh, today, it's commonly um, perceived as an ethnic uh, ethno-religion, but back then there were people who perceived it as just being a race, a religion, and that there's a whole debate about that. The next thing we're going to be talking about is paramilitary organizations within the time of the mandate. Uh, now, why were there paramilitary organizations and when did they form? With the first, with the culmination of the first Aliyah, which was from 1882 to 8, 1903, uh, the way that Jews who were immigrating were protecting their farms was by getting Arab laborers to work for them, essentially being security guards because they spoke, to, they spoke the language, they spoke Arabic, and so they were able to protect their farms and there were better relations. When the second Aliyah started in 1904, there was a concept of um, Hebrew labor that if we, the Jews, are to build our homeland in this um, within Palestine, then we need Jews to be doing it. And so they replaced the Arab laborers with Jewish ones. And one of the first things they did a little bit later on in 1909 was form the Hashomer. Hashomer was essentially the first group that was responsible, organized group that was responsible for protecting and safeguarding Jewish settlements that were under attack from thieves and other individuals or extremists at the time. In 1920, they were disbanded, the uh, Hashomer, and they what were formed was the Haganah. Now, the Haganah was the main paramilitary organization of the British Mandate of Palestine that was, that was uh, charged with protecting Jews within the mandate from later on from British attacks, but also from Arabs and other hostilities. In 1931, um, after the 1929 uh, Hevon massacre that took place uh, where uh, there was a, a riot and Arabs uh, ended up uh, massacring, um, I think, 80 um, Jews in Hevon. I don't know the exact number. I forgot, but I'll look into it afterwards or someone can say it in the chat. Uh, the Irgun became an offshoot of the Haganah. They didn't like the way that the Haganah was acting and they wanted to be a little bit more forceful. And so their main goal was to facilitate Jewish immigration through any means necessary. Uh, they were considered by many different organizations throughout their time, by the British, by the Americans, um, as well as by Jewish organizations such as the Jewish Agency uh, as terrorist organizations due to the fact that they would conduct um, assaults against uh, civilian objectives. 
they saw both the British and the Arabs as occupiers, and so they attacked them concurrently. In the 1940s, things changed, and there was another offshoot from the Irgun, which was called the Lehi. Now, the Lehi were a lot more extreme. They also self-described themselves as terrorists. Um, they were a lot more extreme uh, due to the fact that in 1939, there was the, the British uh, white paper. Now, the main thing that came out of that was due to the heightened tensions that were happening within the land, mainly as a result of the 1936 to 1939 Arab revolt that occurred. Uh, the British understood that there was a lot of tensions growing in the land, so they thought of ways to mitigate the, the violence. And one of them was by limiting Jewish immigration into the land. Now, this happened at a very, very monumental time it, because it happened not long before the Second World War broke out and then eventually uh, the Holocaust in 1941 or two. And so the Lehi saw this as a betrayal of what they had promised the Jews earlier in the Balfour Declaration. And as a result, they uh, decided to go against the British with all their force. They also thought about maybe even joining Germany and fighting uh, the British. That's how much they hated the British at that point. Um, they also had very much an ideology of greater Israel, of expansionism, um, and they were always considered an extreme by most groups. Later on in 1948, um, very, very soon in, right almost two weeks after the declaration of the, of the State of Israel, um, the IDF was formed, the Israel Defense Force. Uh, they were formed by uh, disbanding and merging the Haganah, Irgun, and the Lehi, different aspects of them. Now, this didn't happen all at the exact same time. There was a lot of internal feuds that occurred, um, as well as the Palmach, which was an elite fighting unit that was for the British at the time. Now, the reason we're showing this is actually this newspaper. Uh, this newspaper is from July, um, June 1st, 1948. Uh, and the significance of this newspaper is that on, 19, on 1948, uh, May 31st, the, the, dec the declaration for there to be formed in IDF, um, Israel Defense Force, was seen as legal by the newly established government. And this was the swearing in ceremony of the IDF. So this paper is essentially talking about the swearing in ceremony, the establishment of the IDF. And so in my opinion, it's a very, very um, important document, a uh, newspaper that, can, that showcases such a moment, um, historical moment in terms of the state of Israel and the establishment of the IDF in itself. Before we continue, um, just want to make sure that everyone's on the same board and understanding where we're at. Um, so if there's any questions in the chat, I'll take a few minutes to look at them to make sure that I'm not missing anyone, um, and if any things were asked. <clears throat> so, so far it seems there's no questions, but if there are I'll be sure to um, look back. So this document is a bit more of a personal one, an interesting one from the time. Uh, it's from Lida Airport. Now Lida Airport was established as you can see in 1934 at the request of a British company named Airworks Services. Uh, in 1943, it was actually used as a um, Royal Air Force station and became a major airfield for them. So the British were fighting multiple different fronts of the axis of Nazi Germany and their allies within the region, in the north of Africa, in the Middle East, and in Europe. And this air base in the center of the Mandate of Palestine became a hub for their um, air force to go to and back. And this individual named David Mizrahi, uh, he was a mechanic, and he, driver, and another, he's also a mechanic, so I think MTO is probably him being a mechanic. Um, the reason I say mechanic is there's actually, I have another document, which we'll look at later, that also belongs to David Mizrahi. Um, Lida Airport today is actually Ben Gurion Airport. So uh, shortly after um, the, um, the IDF took it over in the 1948 war, they named it the Lod Airport. Lod was the name of a town situated right nearby. And then later on, it was renamed as Ben Gurion Airport. And so this specific document 
um, was his identification pass for the, the overseas British Airways uh, where he worked. Now, <clears throat> this is one of the last pieces, um, and it's very, very complicated in terms of trying to understand everything. But I think it's very important to understand the next document that we're going to be seeing. And so I'm going to attempt uh, to explain everything here as easy as possible. During World War I, there were three different documents that were signed, agreed upon, or discussed. The sykes picot Agreement, the Balfour Declaration, and the mcmahon hussein Agreements. Now, these agreements are essentially the foundation of a lot of the issues in regards to the legal claim over the land and the territory. The sykes picot Agreement was a secret agreement uh, conducted in 1916, which uh, separated the region into British and French uh, spheres of influence on uh, two levels, A and B. Um, on A, you would have um, complete French or British control, that they would control every aspect of the government. Essentially, it would be a puppet government. And B was where you would simply have those in power um, be in favorable towards the British or the, the French, but the locals would uh, have their own autonomy. This agreement never really manifested into anything uh, concrete, uh, but it was used as the basis for a lot of discussions. The Balfour Declaration was a agreement, a essentially a declaration that was given in 1917 by the British. And what it promised was a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. Now, there's no legal basis for na Jewish national homeland in international law at this time. So no, no one understood what this actually meant. The reason it was actually named the Jewish national homeland is because of how ambiguous it was. And that's why they agreed upon that name. Um, it said that in the agreement that Jews would have a, a, that they would have a Jewish national homeland within Palestine. And later on, uh, but that the civil and political rights of others within the region would not be har um, hampered. However, something that immediately is very problematic in this line, which we'll discuss here is Palestine. Palestine at this point was not exactly defined. It was, Palestine was a generic term for the region, which included three different districts. Uh, the district, which is called by the Ottoman Empire, Sanjak, the Sanjak of Nablus, the Sanjak of Akka, and the Sanjak of uh, Al-Quds, Jerusalem. And so these different regions were actually not exact. They changed over time. Sometimes they included the uh, Sanjak of uh, Jerusalem included a lot, sometimes it didn't. Um, they changed over time. There was a time when it was the Sanjak of Syria that moved in, and it was just Sanjak of Jerusalem and Syria. And so these constantly were shifting. So it wasn't really clear what they were talking about at that time. But instead, in Palestine. The next thing that occurred was that when it was, was the creation of the League of Nations, and one of the things with inside the Declaration, the Covenant, was Article 22. Article 22 is really, really important to understand why things happened the way they did. Article 22 essentially talked about colonial powers and how they were to treat the local communities, the local people that they had occupied for so many years as an empire. The point of a mandate was to allow the local population to grow themselves, grow and sustain the political systems at hand in order for them to be able to then one day declare independence and be an independent people. That was the point of a mandate. And so Article 22 was applied to the San Remo Conference when it came to the mandate of Palestine. The mandate of Palestine wasn't entirely defined at this time. Uh, it's not actually clear within the agreement whether or not it included Transjordan, Transjordan being the area across the Jordan River, which is today Jordan. Um, and that will be made later understood in another agreement that we're going to be talking about. And so within the San Romero Remo agreement, it was essentially um, agreed upon that the mandate of Palestine would be, the Balfour Declaration would be included in this. And that when the individuals within this land were able to facilitate their own independent governments and peoplehood, then they could form a government. The Treatise uh, Service 
don't know if I'm butchering the name correctly, was kind of a continuation of the San Remo Agreement, the San Remo Conference, and it essentially defined more the boundaries of the mandate of Syria, the mandate of Mesopotamia, which became Iraq, and the mandate of Palestine, which was not still really defined at this point. There's a reason I'm not talking about the McMahon Hussein Agreement, and that will come up later. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is the White Paper of 1922. This isn't a paper that is really discussed that much, and I don't know why, because I think it's very, very important to understand the time period. The White Paper of 1922 tried to make sense of what was written in the Balfour Declaration. And it explicitly said, which was up to people's interpretations at this point, that Jews would have a national homeland in Palestine, which means that they weren't going to get a country, that the Palestine was not promised to them to be the Jewish country, but that they would get a national homeland in Palestine side by side with the Arab majority that they would live in peace with. Um, <clears throat> he actually specifically talks about a very famous quote is that, um, Palestine is to the, I think it's Palestine or Israel, Palestine is to the Jews what Britain is to the British. Uh, I was talking essentially saying that uh, Palestine is Jewish and that it is of the Jews. It's for the Jewish people. And Churchill wrote in the white paper that he was entirely against this and that that wasn't the point of the Balfour Declaration. Essentially what he envisioned from what we can make out from the white paper is that the homeland would essentially be a hub for the Jewish people within Palestine. And that's where Jews from around the world could turn to if they needed help. Kind of if you think about how the Jewish agency worked under the British mandate and helped facilitate the immigration of Jews. So that's what the Jewish homeland was supposed to become, according to the white paper. Now, before the mandate of Palestine was official in August of, I think it was September or August of 1922, the last thing we need to talk about is the McMahon Hussein Agreement. The McMahon Hussein Agreement actually came before the Sykes Picot Agreement and the Balfour Declaration, but the Sykes Picot Agreement was most likely being talked about at the same time that the McMahon Hussein Agreement was. Uh, the British were notorious at this time for constantly promising one thing to one group and the opposite to another um, that would eventually conflict with one another. So the main thing with the McMahon Hussein Agreement was what it promised was that if the Hussein, who was the self-described leader of the Arab people at the time, if he helped the British defeat the Ottoman Empire, then they would be allowed to create independent Arab states in the region. That would be, that would be Arab territory. In the agreement, McMahon responds to this uh, claim that we'll fight for you if you give us the territory and gives two stipulations, which I'm going to showcase exactly where they are later. Um, they talk about two places that are up north that are around Turkey. And that's because that place would eventually become Lebanon and uh, Turkey. And to the west of Damascus, Holmes, and one other place, I can't remember what the name of it was, and said everything to the west of this area, because of the diverse nature of the population, and because it wasn't a cohesive Arab population, it would not be included in the agreement. Now, my interpretation of it is different than what I've, I've seen is the consensus. The consensus, the consensus is that there is no consensus, that it's not entirely understood what they were talking about. But to me, it seems pretty clear. Uh, now, this is entirely my opinion, that the places to the west of Holmes and Damascus was the Sanjek of Nablus, Akka, and Al-Quds, which means that this area of Palestine, that region, was not included in the Mikmahan Hussein Agreement. Now, this was something that the Arabs were pissed off about around the 1920s when they saw the Balfour Declaration get um, announced, and then later at the San Remo Conference. And so the Cairo Conference that happened in 1921 tried, similar to the White Paper, to, dis to, uh, to stop these claims. And essentially what they said was that the Palestine, that region, that territory was never included, and that Transjordan 
the area across the Jordan River was included in your in the promises to you. And so after the mandate of Palestine was completed in uh, only a few months later, in 1922, a memorandum occurred on the mandate of Palestine and a 25th article was added, which said that the mandate of Palestine in terms of the government would proceed over both Palestine and also Transjordan. However, um, Article 4, I think it was, that regarded to the Balfour Declaration of establishing a Jewish national homeland was not included in the Transjordan territory. And so that's why we see a difference. Um, this is a pretty good explanation of the issue that arose here. So if you look on the map on the left, this is different subjects of that area. Viliath is a province and Viliath is a province and Sanjek is a district. And so as you can see, we have the Akko Sanjek uh, and the Nablu Sanjek. We also see Nasra, but again, these Sanjek sometimes change. But essentially from Akka to uh, the Sanjek of Jerusalem, this was the area that according to my reading of the official McMahon Hussein agreements was not included in their promise. What we're seeing on the right, which is the British Mandate of Palestine, did exist. When the British Mandate of Palestine over, oversaw the area, this is the area that, that was in the map, except straight down the middle where you see the, the Dead Sea, the Canaret, and the Jordan River, that's where the administration uh, structure changed. And that's why in this uh, document of David Mizrahi, which was a uh, document essentially for him to be able to freely pass, we see on the other side, identification pass British troops, Palestine and Transjordan, as in they were under the exact same mandate, but they were considered different areas, which is why even on the actual identification pass, they're seen as different areas. So that's essentially the presentation. If anyone has any questions about anything I discussed until now, clarifications, you want to look over the documents more, um, talk about other documents in my collection that I haven't talked about lately, um, feel free to. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and thank you for watching. <clears throat> um, we see a first question by Tome. He asked, when when the mandate began, was there any agreement about its time scale and successor entities? So there was. In the actual um, mandate of Palestine, in the actual mandate of Palestine um, that was written in 1920, it said that the mandate would exist as long as it needed in order to facilitate the growth of internal independent structures of government and then provide. Uh, them with a country in order to run themselves. Um, I kind of like to compare it a little bit to if you have some knowledge on the Oslo Accords, the whole point was to have an interim agreement of five years, as in start getting the Palestinians at the, now I'm talking about the Oslo Accords, but start getting the um, population to be prepared for self governance. And then after five years, they would become a country. And so that was the same concept of a mandate. Um, and so each, both the Jews, the Arabs, and all these different groups within the, within the mandate were vying to kind of like prove themselves to the British that they could self-govern. Um, regarding actually what type of country they thought was viable, um, in the 1939 White Paper, which also talked about stopping Jewish immigration, the British essentially talked about a confederacy. Um, it also seems that that was something that they always wanted was that the British mandate of Palestine would eventually become a confederacy of a Jewish state and an Arab state within the same land of Palestine. Um, you can see that in the writing in 1939, it's very explicit. Um, I actually have the documents. I can find it if you'd like me to actually read what it actually says. Um, but yeah, there, it wasn't clearly explicit, but it was essentially that was the whole point of the mandate was to eventually establish, um, have successors. Um, Jake talks about coming on and showcasing his stuff. If anyone has anything they'd like to show, feel free to contact me on Twitter or Discord um, and bring you on for the next discussion and showcase things that you have. Um, I also happily am about to get a British passport from the Mandate of Palestine as well. Um, it should be arriving in a few days, so I'm happy to get that and add that to my collection. 
Um, but I'd love to see other people's stuff. I think that um, it's really amazing when people are able to share the types of things from their personal collection and their family. So we'll leave a few more seconds for any type of uh, thing or duration, anything I didn't make clear. Um, I tried to go everything as clean as possible without injecting too much of my own personal bias, except the one thing that I tried to make clear is my personal opinion. Um, but yeah. So Jeremy asks, uh, we talked about this a little bit, uh, why did the British give over 60% of the land to Jordan? So it stems from two different issues. Uh, one of them had to do with the fact that the boundaries, one talks about giving uh, the Palestinians land um, in terms of Jordan. So in the actual San Remo agreement, which is what defined what would be the mandate of Palestine, Transjordan was never explicitly talked about at all. The only first time Transjordan is mentioned in regard to the uh, mandate of Palestine is in the... Um, in the Cairo conference of 1921, and then in the memorandum of Transjordan. Uh, the reason that it became, one of the main reasons that it became Transjordan is that it was an area that was essentially promised to the Arabs um, in 1916 in the Mikmahan Hussein agreement. And so that's why it was supposed to be theirs. Transjordan, um, in the original promise of the Balfour Declaration, only a small portion of the land um, after the Jordan River was considered a part of the region of Palestine at that time um, in terms of a, official boundaries that there kind of and kind of wasn't that kept shifting. Uh, so Transjordan never really was a part of the, the British mandate of Palestine in terms of the agreement of the Balfour Declaration. That was something that was added on through interpretation, in my opinion. Um, Jake asked about um, Instagram. I don't use Instagram for anything. I just personal stuff. It's not for my career or my work or stuff like this. The best ways to reach me are either through my Twitter account and DMs, or you can reach out to me in the Discord community of Surha. Uh, those are the two places that you can reach out to me that I'll answer back. Um, other Facebook and uh, Instagram are private. I don't, I don't mix the two. Wait a few more minutes if anyone else has any questions they'd like to ask. Um, I'll go back to this area if anyone has any questions about this slide and how are certain things here connected. Okay, so um, I had a really good time explaining uh, these things to you, sharing my collection, and hopefully some insight. Um, I hope I was able to teach something to you and you were able to learn. Um, I had a really good time, and thank you for staying with me. And see you on the next round. Have a good night, everyone.